Hello. Okay. Because it's entirely possible that this isn't... Oh, dear. I don't think he was recording my voice for a while. Ah, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, is it all right now? Now it's working. Okay. Ah. <laughs> should, so... we try, should we start again? Oh, it was a really nice. It was a really nice introduction. Well, I yeah. That up. Oh dear. Suppose I could splice the bit in about me talking about um, Borderlands. <laughs> okay. I've spoken about this before. I don't know if I have to you about this whole rating system where everything's got a rarity, and it's I can't remember what I called it, but. What it used to be for most games was that rarity wasn't like a recognized in-game stat. It was just a thing. So if something had a 2% drop rate from a high-level enemy, you knew it was rare because of how hard it was to get. And the quality of it was based on, you know, its own stats and everything. But yeah, like with Borderlands and all those other things... And, of course, loot boxes play into all this. You know, you get these beams of light, and it's always, like, white for common and green for uncommon, and it, it's pretty much always in the same order. And it is, like you said, just a way for people to, at a quick glance, just to know that's the good thing. That's the thing that I want to fill the dopamine in the brain. And, you know, when I was playing Borderlands 2... I was playing it, I think it was, no, I don't think it was last September. It might have been. No, I think it was the September before last in 2020. I was, I was thinking to myself, right, I want to get through Borderlands. I'm going to, Borderlands 2, I'm going to get the platinum because I've been on and off it for so long. I'm just going to sit and do it. So I did. And I remember focusing so much on finding that higher tier type of item i don't know what the name was but it was the one with the orange the little orange beam coming out of it and i was like looking online to see what enemies what bosses drop it and at what chance and everything and i got so into it that this idea of a little orange light just took over my brain so when i went to say for example just get something to eat i'd open up the fridge and in my mind i'm thinking oh i hope there's something with a little orange line jumping <laughs> It just, it just got, it's, yeah, it's got its way into my brain. I was, I was looking for little orange lights as I was looking for food. So, uh, uh, this is, this is really awkward. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, we just spoke. We had a brief technical problem. We've lost nine minutes of, of recording. Uh, we were talking about Borderlands and about, um, and about the rarity and the items are can be classified as rare and they have a special color well how can i put this it's it's in it's you can call it an innovation that somebody decided to add a color to this like you said orange took over your brain um it's i'm not sure i like it to be honest I'll take in in Borderlands for example. I remember I was playing with a friend who was far more into Borderlands and knew so much more about it than I did. I was there, kind of in for the ride. We were playing it, playing it as uh, just just the two of us. And I remember that he he was reading up on where to get rare red rare, rare drops and stuff. So I was helping. Well, we were helping each other farm, and we were doing quite well. And then we ended up getting a rare drop, and it was a shield. It was a shield called the B or something. I don't know if you know what that is. Yes, I kind of remember, but not exactly. I just remember it was a really good one. Yeah, so it was a shield, and I remember it was like there was there was like an elevated viaduct of some sort, and you had to fight this bot, this this thing, but over and over again, we had to leave the uh, leave the area, come back and fight him, and then leave the area, come back and fight him, or something along those lines. And we got this shield, but. As my as my friend Tom remembers, uh, I'm sure he remembers. I was absolutely dreadful at Borderlands when it came to just managing the shields because I just didn't care. I just all I wanted to do was shoot things, 
and min maxing or kind of having the best possible sort of setup didn't really interest me back then and so i had this b after well before i got it all i knew is that i got downed quite a lot but because i had a different rare weapon i had a weapon that was it was a repeater that was i think it was a green green or purple maybe i can't remember what color it had i don't think it was it was an epic one or it wasn't an orange one or a gold one um but i just remember that it was a repeater that had infinite ammo and it got more accurate the longer you shot and because i was playing a zero and my class was kind of geared more towards pistols uh, it meant that as soon as i got downed i could just find myself an enemy and just pummel them with his pistol and i would you know get myself back up and it wasn't actually that much of an issue and i just remember that when i finally got this b we'd spent like an hour and a half or an hour doing this uh, when I finally got the B shield, all I, I kind of, I didn't feel anything. I didn't feel like that sense of, that sense of satisfaction that he, that he felt. Uh, all I thought was, okay, I've got this shield. Now let's go and do something else. Um, but admittedly, I did play better afterwards. So what does the B do? I remember it was very much a case of it's got one big disadvantage, but one big advantage. Is that right? Uh, I can't remember the B. I just remember what it looked like, what it was called. Because if you can imagine, a very reluctant me was spending two hours trying to get this thing called a B. Uh, Borderland. I'm just, I'm just searching it now. Okay. The B is a legendary amplifier shield made by Hyperion and Borderlands 2. It is obtained randomly from any suitable loot source, but has an increased chance to drop from Hunter Hellquist, located in Arid Nexus Boneyard uh okay it's got no amp drain high amp damage reduced shield capacity increased shield recharge rate and recharge delay so it has right. low shield capacity long recharge delay but gives extraordinary amp damage uh so yeah. i'm guessing it's good if you're good at dodging attacks i don't know yeah, it's one of those things you do. It's been a while. To... It's been a while since I played. Yeah, it's been over a year for me. Mm. Um, I would have to make a complaint though about about Borderlands in general. And I suppose this sort of fix on. I don't know if you'd call it an unusual mechanic. I suppose it sort of matches the the topic. But I I've never liked the the second wind mechanic. Oh, yeah. I've never liked it. Yeah, that was kind of integral to my to my play because I was that bad. Well, there's been several times where it saved me, but I've always felt like I, I, it's just very strange to me. If you are in a room full of enemies and you, for example, take one of them down, so they're on like a last leather of health and then you get killed, it's good that they're still there for you to be able to get the second wind. But if you kill them first, and then you get knocked down, it's like, well, there's no weakened enemies for me to take advantage of now. Mm -hmm. So, so, mm? so what's the problem? Apart, well, apart the pro from that kind of mechanic. Yeah, it's just... It rewards the timing, and it also rewards your lack of success in defeating an enemy. Mm -hmm. in that By not defeating enemies when you're you know alive you are providing yourself ample resources to fully heal yourself mm -hmm. uh, see i don't really think i know i never came into that problem it's, admittedly i don't think i played borderlands 2 alone i played borderlands 1 alone and so i was always playing with a friend and he he was far better than i was at the game so i was kind of if you can imagine going to an adventure playground or like to a uh to like a place with lots of climbing frames and stuff and you've your all the other kids are just climbing on their own but you're there with your dad holding you by the weight by the hips and you're just <laughs> pretending to climb that's kind of what i was like <laughs> yeah 
Yeah. So yeah. Uh, to be honest, it's not. I don't feel. I don't think it's too much of an issue. Well, uh, it's one. Uh, of the, especially, it's... especially considering. Uh, I think in most games, I enjoy using. I enjoy using the sidearms. I don't like having a bazooka. I don't like having, you know, a shotgun. I prefer just having a, a pea shooter, a pistol, a little one. That's that's what I always go for, actually. And I think in in most games, most shooting it's, games, it's very similar to what I mentioned a while ago about when when games will display your last bit of health as if it is less than what it actually oh, is, yeah. so mm-hmm. that you. So that you feel more successful, like "Ooh, I made that out by the skin of my teeth." Yeah. When you actually do succeed, that's the feeling it's trying to elicit. Mm-hmm. When you when you do get that second win, it's like "Ooh, I managed to pull through in the end." Yeah. Uh, yeah, that we we spoke about that before. I don't I don't think I've ever come across that. There have you have you um. Have you had much experience with games that have just been cruel? Not on the difficulty, not that there's like a transparent uh, um, steep difficulty or a steep uh, learning curve. For example, Dark Souls or Demon Souls or whatever, Soulsborne, everything Souls. Those games are just difficult, right? Well, those games are evidently difficult. I mean, when you start, it's um, it's very, you're very, it's, you can die very quickly and it's not always clear how you're supposed to kill your and defeat your enemies and you have to learn by basically failing learn through failure if especially if you're a noob like me well i'll explain how gran trismo the old games worked and then maybe you can comment on it so okay gran trismo one i believe maybe gran trismo two as well I think Gran Turismo 2 was more unfinished, so they really rushed the game. And so they might have had errors. So the, I don't know if these were intentional or not, but they basically there were some races where the player was told you can only have a car that's X powerful, that has X horsepower. Let's say you can only have a car that has 200 horsepower. Okay, so you've got to find yourself a car. You might find one that weighs very little. Obviously not as little that it shoots off into space, but uh that weighs uh let's say 500 kilograms but has 200 horsepower which means it has 400 horsepower per ton so that means it's very good um but the the ai the the computer that you're racing against they don't have to play by those rules and sometimes in some of the races they had a car that was far 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 better far more powerful more more capable than yours is allowed to be and so the computer cheated and those races were incredibly difficult, near impossible for for casual players, but it's through no fault of their own. And to to the I think to the to this day we don't really know if it was intentional or not. Probably wasn't, to be fair. Uh, but how do you feel about that? How do you feel about games which are just horribly, kind of cruelly difficult without actually explaining to the player why they're not winning or why they're not doing well? It sort of it sort of reminds me of when you get those RTSs. And I don't really play RTSs. I've played Edge of Empires 2, but that's it really. But it reminds me of those RTSs when certain computer AI on a certain difficulty setting will just randomly get resources out of nowhere. It's sort of uh, it's set up in such a way that imitates a multiplayer environment even though it isn't, mm-hmm. if you get what I mean. So you wouldn't, for example, say that a boss in a Final Fantasy game is a giant dragon, and you wouldn't say, that's not fair, we can't be a giant dragon. Uh-huh. It's, I think it's to do with the way that it's framed. Mm-hmm. It does seem a bit strange, though, with the whole, you're only allowed a car with so much horsepower. Yeah. It's, it's it's really really difficult. Yeah. There's no other way to describe it. Okay, well today we were supposed to talk about. Uh, sorry, it's going to be a little bit a little clicking while I move around my windows. Um, we were supposed to talk about innov- innov- uh, innovation in games. Now, I am not as adventurous as you when I when it comes to games. I don't play as many games. I don't play as many varied various games. Uh, but I could think of two. 
Okay. And these are two fairly laughable innovations. Right. And so, see, yeah. see, now, I've got it written down as unusual game mechanics. So I don't know if you've been thinking of something different to me. Aha, uh-huh. I thought you meant innovations. Uh, for some reason, I mean, in my can... mind, I had innovations. That's, that's okay. <laughs> that's fair enough. Unusual game as mechanics. A... Yeah, I suppose I suppose they, there's a strong overlap there. Okay. So that was a bit of a miscommunication or just simply my, my brain uh, overwrote. Uh, in a bit, uh, sorry, unusual game mechanics with innovation. But okay, I can make this right. work. Uh, okay. So the first one, okay, we'll get this over and done with because this is really silly. So this was innovation that is kind of stupid uh, or kind of obvious, but I just remember at the time it was touted as absolutely groundbreaking. And that was <laughs> in FIFA football. Uh, in FIFA 10, they released the feature that the player is no longer on running tracks. So in FIFA 09, the player could only run in eight directions. But in FIFA 10, it was 360 degree movement. So where you pointed the analog stick, that's where the player would go. And this seems now to be completely obvious. But back then, I just remember it was heavily advertised that, oh my Lord, it's amazing. Uh, And the second thing, so that's, uh, we we can just move on from that. Uh, the second thing that I, I wanted to bring up. Okay, say so what were you going to say? No, we we can we can talk about it because I know you know a lot of a lot of um, I can <laughs> that actually does remind me of and I suppose it, it's unlinked, but you know this is how it goes. You reminded me of a story mm-hmm. when I first got my PS2. I got Tony Ox three, and I had a demo disc, and on the demo disc was Dark Cloud, and when I loaded it up. It played the intro cutscene and everything, and then it started, and I was just stood in the middle of this empty field, and I'm thinking, I can't move. Why can't I move? I thought I was stuck. <laughs> Turns out that you move with the analog stick, uh-huh. because I was, I was used to PS1 games where the analog stick was just an alternate version of the D-pad. Mm-hmm. So I was trying to move with the D-pad like I would in a PS1 game, which does have that eight-directional direction, eight directional movement. But it turns out that, oh, no, the, the analog stick is actually a different input now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, firstly, I can I can picture Dark Cloud, because I remember I had that same demo, and I, I loved it. I just played Dark Cloud over and over again. Mainly just watched the opening cutscene and then wandered around because I didn't know how to play the game. I went as far as going into the cave, but then didn't know what to do afterwards. But it also just yeah. reminds me of just a standard childhood kind of tactic of older siblings. I don't know if you ever did this to to your, to your brother, um, <laughs> which is, I don't, I don't know if I've said this before, I probably have, maybe on a stream. But I just remember my oldest brother was uh, playing a racing, playing Gran Turismo. And I really wanted to play. And to shut me up, he gave me one of the controllers that wasn't even connected to the PlayStation and said, okay, now race. You're all the other cars. And I was just so happy with myself that I was racing and I was controlling all the other cars. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, what's What's funny about that is that I knew what you were going to say. I knew you... <laughs> I knew you were going to say something along those lines, but for me it was even worse than that. Uh-huh. I've been admitted, like, well, you can't play, but you can pretend to play. <laughs> just, oh, it was just no facade at all. Just give a control and say, right, you can pretend. <laughs> but let's 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 face it. This the question is quite difficult. Who's crueler, him or you? As in my my brother or you? <laughs> I think uh, <laughs> I don't know because back then I was happy, but maybe maybe your brother was happy as well to do that. <laughs> but so did you believe you were controlling all the other races, yeah. all the other cars? Yeah, I must have right. been. I must have been five at the time, or maybe even younger. No, five, right. five probably. So this was this would have been nineteen ninety eight, right? Uh, ninety eight or ninety nine. Yeah, so I'd have been five or six. Yeah. No, I just said, I just said, you can pretend. Yeah. And he was like, all right, then. <laughs> I think, I think one time it got to the point where he said, you just spot up and said, can I pretend to play, please? Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> yeah, you are cruel. <laughs> but it, it worked out. It worked out for me. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the other thing that I had under the umbrella of innovation, because of course I, I didn't do my homework properly. It's uh, all right. The other thing was actually, it's actually a peeve of mine. When I was young, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth, I mean, I'm younger than you, I think. Uh, yeah. <laughs> back when I was a kid and games were not like they are these days, games were better. Uh, we had med packs and we had health bars, right? Yeah. And I remember when Call of Duty 4 came around and Call of Duty 4 was groundbreaking in that just how popular it was and how it just made... Uh, multiplayer online really really addictive uh, and really addictive and maybe uh, accessible uh, to the mainstream well they did away with health bars and they did away with med packs and they replaced it with jam yeah so when you get it's hit you, you just suddenly have jam on your or jam on your camera or jam on your face. I don't. I didn't quite. At the time, it was. Of course, it's blood. Of course, I'm injured. It's fine. But just looking at it, taking a step back, it's just daft. I mean, I don't feel more immersed. All I feel is that I've got jam. On. <laughs> I'm looking at the at the battlefield through a pane of glass that's got jam smeared all over it. Yeah, I always remember the. Like the image of Modern Warfare, and I, I know it's Modern Warfare 2, even though I've never played a Call of Duty game, mm -hmm. but it's the image of Modern Warfare 2 with that jam because it looks like it, it does look like jam in the fact that it looks liquidy, but yep. you can also see the little chunks as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's almost, yeah, so, though, it's almost as though that's what they were going for, I think. So what do you what do you make of this regenerating health business regenerating health is fine like halo's halo's method that you had shields and the shields regenerated uh oh yeah it's kind of similar level to, to kind of similar <laughs> to like uh, to level up land one uh, i was waiting for that <laughs> yeah so i don't i don't quite mind that i don't even mind if that your health is you know you're low on health and you uh it and you know it will regenerate uh, a certain amount like borderlands system is quite good i think your shield regenerates and the shields are different so if you get a better shield it regenerate faster or maybe it won't but it has a higher capacity that's kind of cool but why jelly <laughs> it's just what does he wipe the jelly off and everything's fine now and what happens when you play the hardcore mode so the hardcore mode on call of duty games is where you have less health so you don't start with 100 hp you only start with 40 i think or 30 no, sorry, that might be Battlefield. Anyway, so you start with less health and the health doesn't regenerate. But you still get jam on your face. And the jam <laughs> kind of comes on, but it doesn't, and it goes away, but you didn't get your health back. So it kind of cheats you into thinking that you've got your health back when you haven't, when you're, you're still really low. Either way, you can't find a med pack. You can't re recover that health. So it's, uh, so it's kind of pointless. I don't know. I I don't have a problem with it. I just don't like the execution. So your health doesn't regenerate, but the jam fades away yeah. the same amount. I think the jam fades away. This just the same. I think at least on uh I think at least the most recent one I played was Black Ops. So this was from 2009. And if I'm not mistaken, I could be that one if you get hit, you get jelly on your face and then jam on your face. Sorry, jelly is American, American English. You get jam on your face and then it, it sort of fades and then you can continue, but you still have the same amount of health as you had before. So, uh, I mean, I don't expect you to know the answer to this, but that, it's just got me curious. So you start with, say, 40 health. Yes. And then you get hit. So you get hit for 20 and you yep. get all the jam on your face and the jam fades away. Yep. So now you're at 20 with no <laughs> <laughs> see how ridiculous it is though <laughs> why can't they give us a health bar right so you're at 20 with, with no jam right yeah and then you get hit for 10 yeah so now you're on 10 so how 
how intense level, is the, the is the, the jam? The, is the, it... the level of jam returns to the same level as it was before. So really, right. it, could lull, it can put you into a self into lull you into a um, a false sense of security because you'll think that you've gone back up to twenty. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's not ideal. Yeah, just use numbers and a bar. It, it's just. All, all these games, like, oh, we're going to make it immersive and realistic. I'd rather just have the information at my disposal. See, I can appreciate, though, uh, not having any information. Oh, well, if it's that's, intentional. If it's intentional, that's fine as well. Recently, I say recently, for the past two years, on and off, I've been playing a game called Insurgency Sandstorm. And it's an f- absolutely fantastic game. I really love it. And one of the reasons I love it is because the developers aren't the kind of they aren't like the developers of most big games that come out. Most uh, kind of let's 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 face it, the, sh- the shooting genre is shooting game genre is really disappointing, just in the way that it is monetized, just to encourage gambling and encourage you know, oh, child gambling is the worst of it. Um, but this one isn't like that. It doesn't include gambling, and. Uh, that's one of the one of the one of the special re- especially one reason why I love it. But that game, it doesn't have depending on what kind of game mode you play. But if you play the the game mode, the proper one, um, it has no information or very little information. I think you get a compass to know where you're supposed to go or know uh, where you're going. If you press escape, you can access a map. And I think your teammates, no, your teammates don't even have don't even have icons above their heads so you know who's your teammate, who isn't. You're supposed to look at the uniforms and decide. But it's, you know, it's fantastic. And yeah, if you, yeah. Get, if you get hit, I don't think you get jelly on your face. If I, I don't think so. So that's a way of, uh, I think uh, you can be suppressed, which means that your screen kind of, um, your eyesight kind of goes blurry. So your screen goes a little bit blurry, which is fine, I think. But you don't get jelly, and I'm happy about it. Yeah. Moving on from uh, the jelly. Sorry, would okay. you like to say something? No, 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 no. Let's let's move on from the jelly. Well, moving on to the oh, jelly. The, on the to jam. Some, moving on from sorry, not the, not the jelly. Moving on from the jam. Uh, I played a game called Need for Speed Shift to Unleashed, or just Shift to Unleashed. I think it's not even called Need for Speed anymore, and. Uh, that game had something, in my opinion, worse than Jelly on Face, Jam on Face. And, or let's say it's on, at, on in the same kind of caliber. So it's a racing game. You can have the, the, uh, the driver's view and you can have a chase camera, right? So you can have a chase camera. So that means it's behind the car and you can see the car as it goes into the corners. And you can also be in from the perspective of the car, so you can see, you know, the pillars, you can see the steering wheel and so on. Well, when you drive over a curb and you kick up some dirt, some mud, you get flecks of, you get um, bits of mud on your screen. But I'm a chase, I'm the chase camera. So that would make sense. That's not so bad, I suppose. (laughs) But if you're the driver, it doesn't actually go on the windscreen necessarily i think it goes on the the screen itself so it kind of it's as though the mud is has somehow managed to get behind your screen and behind your visor your racing helmet visor and onto your eyes it just doesn't make sense to me it's meant to be like an obstacle i imagine isn't it so it distort it distorting your view is it's, like a detriment to you. No, I think it's visual. It's not. It's not. It doesn't. It doesn't inhibit your gameplay or your vision really at all. It's just it's right. Aesthetic. It's just aesthetic. Yeah, it's like you get like I remember in in Final Fantasy thirteen two there was this place where it was raining, and the raindrops would land on the camera, and you'd oh. see them. Yeah. Yeah, that happens. That happens a lot. That's that I remember Grand Theft Auto Vice City is like that. So when it starts raining, you you see raindrops on the on the lens as it were. Yeah. It's really weird. Uh there is a there's so many games do this as well. This is a really 
silly mechanic. Not unusual because it's everywhere. Uh, and that is lens flares. So when you look at the sun or look kind of almost at the sun in the game, you have lens yeah. flares. So you have the little rainbow rings. And that doesn't make sense because human eyes don't work. Human eyes don't work like that. So why? Yeah, it's meant to be, as, as far as I can tell, it's meant to be that you're looking through your eyes. Even yeah. if it's a th even if it's a third person view, you're looking through your eyes at the stuff that's going on. Not through a camera. Well, I understand that there are lens flares in a camera, but yeah, it's, it's not necessary. Like if okay. if it was, oh, we're shooting a film, then fair enough. Yeah. So okay, that would make sense maybe in Uncharted, because I remember I recall reading a, uh, reading a an interview with the creator of Uncharted, perhaps, or maybe it was just like a, a, Q, a short Q&A and it was one of the questions. Uh, either way, I remember the, the, the guy from, the, one of the people who made Uncharted said that the health system in Uncharted isn't that Nathan Drake is being shot at or that he's been hit. It's that his luck is running out. I thought that was quite, that was quite unusual. Hey, I've come up with an unusual, unusual game mechanic. Yeah, yeah so in Uncharted. His, his, luck, his luck is running out. Yeah, his luck is running out. So that right. means, so we're supposed to perceive his journey as, you know, fantastic. It's fiction. It's kind of bonkers, right? And it is. It is bonkers. And when he's getting shot at by enemies, he's not literally, bullets aren't literally sinking into him and he has to go and hide somewhere for the bullets to magically disappear. It's that the enemies are missing, but the, let's say... Mm. Ah, okay, so yeah. let's let's say you're, you he's up against one enemy from a hundred meters, right? And the enemy shoots, and the enemy misses. Well, his Drake's health doesn't go. Nathan's uh, Drake's health doesn't go down by that much, because he's quite far away. So the bullet the bullet does less damage in theory, and it's less likely to hit him. But if he's standing right next to the guy, or let's say only ten meters away, well, then the likelihood of this uh, enemy hitting Nathan Drake is higher which means that Nathan Drake's luck is kind of being eaten away at. So he might miss the first shot, but that means Nathan Drake's luck goes down by 50%. So another, another way of rephrasing this, I imagine, is that it would be as if to say that if, for example, you get hit by three bullets, it's not that three bullets hit him, it's just that the chance of him avoiding all three is low. Yeah, that's a really good way. And I thought that was, that was fantastic. That was a... Uh... Uh, that was uh, really eye-opening for me, actually. I think, yeah, I think it's interesting. I have wondered what if you had, how would it work if you had games where you had characters where it was combat-based, but you didn't have a health stat? Like, things either just killed you or they didn't. Mm -hmm. And I suppose it could be through a probability, but, you know, I mean, there'd, of... there'd be ways around it. There is somebody who did who played Dark Souls three, I think, and he played it with a character whose stats were completely minimal, who didn't have any armor whatsoever. So really, I think, you know, an enemy could have told a bad joke and he would have died. Uh, and he played the entire game all the way through without dying. So that was his kind of challenge. He challenged himself, obviously, because he was very good at the game. And he was able to dodge all the attacks. Well, that's kind of the same thing, right? So he, if he if he got hit just once, then that would have been that would have been game over, or at least he would have had to restart. And as far as as far as I know, I don't think there are many games like that. Well, I have made a list Go on. now. So, some of them, some of them is going to be like. I probably won't be able to go through all of them, but that's all right. Whatever. Um, I've made a list of just some games and just things that just just things that popped into my mind. I thought, oh, I can talk about that. So, um, I'll start off with one that I find quite strange, and this is a game that you might have played, Tekken Three. Tekken Three, I remember it. Yeah. PlayStation One. Yeah, it's got. Uh, Tekken Force and Tekken Ball mod. Okay, I don't remember those. Right. Um, Tekken Force mod is sort of like a, a beat-em-up style 
game where you go through the different levels, like sort of like a Streets of Rage style thing, but you're operating under Tekken mechanics, mm-hmm. and all the enemies are generic goons. Okay. And Tekken Ball Mode is basically volleyball, but you're doing Tekken moves. So you you know you're doing your punches and your kicks and all that. Okay. And you have to try to get the ball behind behind the enemy. Uh huh. Like slime so, soccer. I've not heard of that. I'll tell you another time. Continue. Right. No. Well, that was just that was just uh, okay. one of the things on my list. And actually, I think one of the later games introduced bowling, which is like. I, I don't know how that's got anything to do with Tekken. It actually doesn't actually relate to anything in the game mechanics apart from if you're playing as Jack, you get some extra information on the screen because he's a robot. Bowling? Um, so like... Yeah. Skittles, but big. Just that yeah. kind of bowling. Right, okay. Yeah, but I don't, I don't think it's got any relation to the actual characters themselves. So you uh-huh. could play as any character, and I'm not sure what significance that would have. And other than if you're playing as Jack, mm-hmm. Jack, whatever variation it is in that game. But yeah, that's, so... just, that's just reminded me of something, actually. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you ever played Overwatch. So Overwatch uh, is the shooting mm-hmm. game with lots of the colourful characters and lots of jumping, and it's, it was very un- it's very unpopular now, but it was very popular for a very long time. Or for All quite right, a so long is, time. Is it... Is it not popular now? Well, you say unpopular, you just mean not popular. Yeah, so... Like, unpo- right, okay. No, 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 not, sorry, no, 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 not, not that it's not popular, not that people don't play it, but people don't like it. But I okay. Think, I think people don't like it because of what the community is perceived to be. I think that's one issue, one concern that people have. And the other concern is that Activision Blizzard had a whole thing recently. And that's another right. reason why people don't like them. All right. Uh, so, I don't know. You, I'm sure you you heard about the Activision Blizzard thing. Uh, I've heard, I've heard about a few things. Yeah, well, those things. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So, with uh with Overwatch, the characters, it's really strange. So the the characters all have their own different personalities, and when characters meet each other before the start of a game before the start of, you know, one multiplayer game, they interact with one another. They'll say voice lines. One character will say one thing, another character will reply, and then the first character will reply back, that kind of thing. And the characters, uh, basically, they've they've gone through the, through the ordeal of giving these characters these personalities, these voice lines, to make it seem as though... Uh, the player is engaging in more than just like a red versus blue Blood Gulch Avenue, <laughs> Blood Gulch Canyon, yeah. rather. Uh, Blood Gulch Canyon, you know, deathmatch. It's more than that. It's it, There's a world here. Well, <clears throat> I think it's really the immersion that they build is just completely destroyed when you're playing a character called Zenyatta. That was my favorite character when I played the game. Zenyatta was this kind of, uh, how can I describe it? Kind of like a, um, a Buddhist monk or like a Jain monk. And he was a robot and he was all for peace and things. He was a very peaceful character. But then he's playing on the side that are trying to deliver a bomb to blow something up because they're terrorists. <laughs> I don't. It doesn't make sense. Why add all of that extra information if, if you're going to just ignore the, if you're just going to, Build up the immersion to be destroyed, simply, and because, uh, and because there are good characters and evil characters, or because there are good characters on the, uh, in like the cinematic story, let's say, not the story that takes place in every single game that you play, but in the cinematic story that in the short films that they release, because there are good characters and bad characters. Well, what happens when those, when a good character plays together with a bad character? Well, they have voice lines to interact with one another. But it doesn't help that they're on the same team and they are, you know, both terrorists when they sh- when one of them at least shouldn't be. So, sorry, that was just a a weird a weird thing. I don't I think I don't think I've seen that in many other in many other games. Although, um, 
I think more and more games are going towards that kind of thing, going towards characters uh, that are uh, they're going to they're going for characters that are relatable, perhaps, but most importantly, they're going for characters that people will spend money on to decorate. Yeah, so that we, is. But... Yeah, go go. Yeah, I think with the whole thing with the 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 whole them sharing lines with each other and all that, it's sort of a double edged sword because it's like on one hand they want to make this intricate world with these characters with their own motivations, mm -hmm. but also have this game where it's all a case of, well, let's just have a what if scenario. You can pick who you want. Let's just have an all-out fight or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Like how you've got games where, you know, you've got characters that can just fight each other regardless of whether they're on the same team mm -hmm. in the, the canonical story or even two players playing as the same character fighting each other. That doesn't make any sense. But I think when you, when you add those lines, you try to add a bit more legitimacy to it. Yeah, and, and if, if you don't do it well... <laughs> If you don't yeah. kind of protect your world that you've created, well, then it's kind of going to go all, uh, it's going to go sour. It's going to, it's going to mess up. Okay. Should we move on to your next, uh, your next unusual feature? Um, yeah. So I'm trying to think, I'm not sure which one to do next. Now this, I've got quite a lot here. Now these range from just bizarre and have a, a thing that you know you can actually point to and some of them are just things where i just thought to myself oh, that's a bit weird and for an example of something that i just thought oh that's a bit weird is in the original tomb raider game now i played this last year i've played it before um when i was a kid but i never completed it i got about halfway through but last year i actually played it properly and completed it and one thing that really stood out to me that I really not, began to notice was the magnums, the weapon. Now, you don't get the magnums until you, I think you can get them just past the halfway point. If you miss them at that point, you will definitely get them a few levels afterwards. But what's interesting is that you're getting ammo for, the, for these magnums throughout the entire game. Like right from the first level, you're finding all this ammunition without... Mm actually having the weapon at all it's just there for when you eventually do get them all those hidden secrets that you found that contain all this ammo now you can make use of it is that just thing i thought it's yeah. very forward thinking actually and i also wonder if it is, is is it like a case of minecraft where you look, your character is holding you know 200 bullets and that obviously is going to weigh like 10 kilograms or something and they're still doing loads of acrobatics <laughs> yeah the the quantity of ammo that you have doesn't affect yeah anything other than that's how much you can shoot them mm -hmm. yeah cause I, I was thinking there's so much about so much i suppose what, what's the what's the phrase i'm looking for common oh, i don't know just ideas that people think are the basis for how games should be designed. And one of those things is that one of the ideas is that you should always put things around the time at which they're useful. So mm -hmm. you find ammo for weapons at around the time that you find them so that it matches up. But this is a case of a game that's just done the complete opposite. You'll get them right from the first level for ages and then you won't actually get the weapon until much later. Do you know about the hidden director of Half-Life games? Or Half-Life 2, I think. Have no. Heard, have you heard about this? The hidden director of Half Life Two is uh, such that if you're at, if you are playing the game, you're comfortable pace. You're just doing your own thing. Well, if you are low on ammo for a particular weapon, and you find a place where you you know say you destroy a crate and inside there is a there is a pickup. The game doesn't actually say from the moment you start from the moment you install the game or you've put the disc in. Uh, it hasn't decided what's going to be in that ammo box or in that pickup box. It's only when you're in the moment and let's say you're low on health, you destroy that box, it will be a health pack. Or if you're low on ammo, you destroy that box, it will be an ammo pack or something along those lines. So that's yeah, the that's... hidden director. What do you find? What do you think of that? 
Uh, it, it's again, it reminds me of the whole thing of your health being, it looks like it's lower than it actually is. Mm -hmm. It's, I, I don't know. I don't know how to describe, but I do think that there are certain things that games do where it sort of, it depends on the players being ignorant. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think a game should be, be that whether the player is ignorant of something or whether they know about something, that serves the game. The fact that they're ignorant means that there's something that they can learn uh -huh. that they can then take advantage of. But with something like that, it feels like it's only built for people who, who are ignorant of that fact. Um, and actually, that reminds you know you okay. Two things that that reminds me of. What the first one is that, and this is loosely tied to just the the exact thing that you were talking about. It reminds me of Final Fantasy XII because the chests in Final Fantasy XII are basically just like random loot drops. A lot of them are randomized. They'll spawn certain items, and some of them are incredibly rare and incredibly powerful. It's it's weird. But the other thing it reminds me of, and again, talking about this whole ignorance thing, one thing that Crash Bandicoot does, the first Crash Bandicoot, I don't know about the later ones, but the first Crash Bandicoot is that the more that you die in a level, it will change some of the boxes into checkpoints and it will give you more Aku Aku masks, which is basically like your health. Yes. So when I was playing the Insane Trilogy, I was playing Crash 1. I got to the final boss knowing about this. And I did this in Crash 2 as well. And I started it with, say, like 99 lives. And in Crash 2, I did something like similar. I had lo loads of lives, but a level was giving me trouble. So the final boss of Crash Bandicoot 1, I start the boss and I just jump off. I just jump off the blimp and then it starts up again and I just jump off again. And I keep doing that however many times it takes me to start with a stage 2 Aku Aku mask. Oh, dear. Yeah, so, but to me, that's a case of, I know that it's going to be beneficial for me to do that. I might as well just jump off the blimp. But I think if a game was more respectful, maybe respectful isn't the right word, but didn't depend on your ignorance, it would in incorporate something like, say, a shop where it's, oh, here's a shop. You can spend 10 lives to get some extra masks. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Well, um, see, I don't think it's that much of an issue, personally. But then again, I approach games from the... I think the, one of the fundamental differences between you and me uh, is that when I... When you approach a game, it's about learning the mechanics. This is what I, this is what I believe, so correct me if I'm wrong. When you approach a game, it's about learning the mechanics and learning how to succeed how to play that game well or how to complete that game, how to get all the achievements, um, how to... Uh, basically, how to utilise the world or utilise... Not the world, actually. Utilise the game, the engine, everything that's in the game. Utilise it to succeed, okay? And success is a measure by either, let's say, trophies or just getting to the end or let's say getting 1000 strikes, right? <laughs> right. Uh, well, for me, the difference is that I, the most important thing is my imagination while I'm playing a game. So for me, in the situation that you've just described, jumping off the blip uh, so many times in order to make, have an easier fight, that would be a last resort. I would just try to just play normally and enjoy the game not as not so much as it's intended but in a way that's more immersive and immersion for me doesn't mean that they have to be you know it has to be like real life immersion for me is just simply enjoying enjoying the world as naturally as it should be and crash back uh, let's say crash going through this uh through the whole world and getting to the final boss and defeating the final boss if that's the normal thing well in the middle, if he jumps off a blip 20, 20 times in order to uh, do a bit better, 
then that for me it kind of takes away from the essence of the game well, maybe not the essence of the game it takes away from the feeling of the game well i was just thinking i've got 99 of these lives there's no way i'm going to be using all of them anyway yeah i understand <laughs> so yeah in, in, so your your defense would actually help me as well so like you said that it'd be better for there to be a shop where you can spend these lives um, yeah that makes more sense than simply wasting them uh, and that would be better for me as well because obviously how i'd want to play it i want to defeat the final boss i don't want to be stuck on him but at the same time, I don't want to do the thing that seems really out of place. Well, if buying something in a shop is normal, then that would be perfect, right? Yeah. That would be the perfect solution. And Yeah, and the thing is as well is that I completely agree in the fact that I would rather there be a shop in that regards because you could argue, well, there basically is a shop and that shop is jumping off the blimp ten times. <laughs> do you know what I mean? But that's just it. For people like me, that yeah. that wouldn't suffice. That's horrible. Yeah, but I still, I still, given given the fact that I know I can jump off the blimp ten times, and knowing that if there was a shop that I could spend ten lives to get a mask, even though that would be functionally the same for my playthrough, I would still feel better and feel that the game is better designed with that shop being there mm -hmm. instead. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. We've uh, we've solved a problem, so we yeah. need, to, need to write to Naughty Dog to get it fixed. I tell you what, though, if if when I was a kid and I played Crash Bandicoot, and <laughs> there was there was a shop that said, "Hey, give me ten lives and I'll give you one health," I'd think, "What? <laughs> Why would I do that?" Mm -hmm. But of course, that's that's the thing, isn't it? You know, you grow up and you. And the more exposure that you get to games, you realise, yeah, I thought that thing was terrible, but now I realise it's actually quite good. Yeah. Well, alternatively, you could just uh, pay five pounds not to have to play the final, not to have to fight the final boss. Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, because okay. victory is all that, is all that matters. Yeah. So, what's the uh, what's the next what's the next uh, idea, or next feature? Um, uh, well, I'm sort of just dip, like jumping up and down here. Okay. And I'm, I'm going to the ones that are pretty easy and quick to explain. Odin Sphere. Now, not not the remake that you watched me play. That's This is the game with the level 9 yoghurt. Yes. Right. Od Odin Sphere, the original one. That, that game is just... It's, it's just interesting and in that it's weird in general. But the thing that I want to particularly focus on here is how shops work. Now, in Odin Sphere... You collect money in the form of coins. You don't just have a flat number which determines how much money you have. You actually carry physical coins with you. Now, there's no limit to how many you can carry or anything like that. But shops don't give you change. Mm -hmm. So say if you have a 100G coin, well, and that's all you've got. Well, you've got to spend it. You can't just spend two or whatever. You've got to spend the whole lot. Meaning that you can choose, you can choose like sixty G worth of items, but you will lose the full coin. Mm -hmm. That sounds really cool. I really like that. Yeah. See, now that is the type. That is the type of thing that people would say. Oh, this is stupid. Why can't I do this? Mm -hmm. But I think it's really interesting because, and the game doesn't make a huge deal of this. this is just sort of a background fact. But I think it would be interesting to have it where. It would allow room for, for example, there to be a reward for beating a hard boss being something like a very valuable coin. Mm -hmm. So it's like, this is powerful, but I've got to really think about where I'm going exactly. to spend it. That's amazing. That's such an amazing feature. I've never, I've never come across anything yeah. like that. Yeah. Well, Going, that's, that's a... Taking, taking yeah. that and applying it to a slightly different area. So this isn't as impressive. Uh, but going back to the game I was telling you about, Insurgency Sandstorm. Uh, this is a shooting game. Well, that shoot the shooting game has a mechanic that the ammunition that you have in one in your gun in your weapon, it's not just a, like a, an abstract pool of numbers. So let's say in one magazine you have thirty bullets, so you can fire thirty times, right? 
So right. let's say you only fire five times and then you reload. Mm, yeah. The, the 25 bullets that you didn't fire, they go into, they don't go, well, in normal games, they go into this abstract pool of bullets. And that, so when you, let's say you do the same thing again, you only fire five and then you reload, all the bullets go into this abstract pool. And then at the end, at the end, when you fired all the other bullets, let's say, in one magazine, you will have uh, only 20 rounds instead of two times 25. Right? No. Right. Well, basically, that they'll, they'll, you, they'll, they won't, uh, the, whatever you have left, you know, the odd, the bits and uh, the, let's say the odd round that you leave inside the, the odd bullet that you leave inside the magazine. Well, this will all be added up magically into this final magazine that you put into your gun. Well, in Insurgency yeah. Sandstorm, if you reload, let's say you only fire one bullet and you reload, well, then you will have a magazine stored that has one bullet less than full capacity. All right. Okay. So then when you get back around to it and you reload and put that magazine in, yes. you've got... What? Right. See, I thought you were going to say that those bullets just get discarded. That's just it. it. You can. So there are two ways to reload. So there's one way to reload, which is a slow reload, which means you just tap R on the keyboard. And this means that your character will carefully remove the magazine. He'll put it into his pocket or she'll put it into her pocket. And then uh, he'll add, uh, they'll add uh, another magazine to the, to, the, to the weapon. But if you press R twice, if you double tap R, the character will very, very quickly uh, throw away the other magazine and put in a new one. So let's say a slow reload will take two seconds to do. The quick reload will only take one. And so if you're in a really, really tense situation and you fired all your bullets, you'll double tap R to get rid of it, to get rid of the one that you already have. But if, uh, for example, let's say you think you're in a safe place and you tap R uh, if you, you're ready, you're ready to tap R once to do a slow reload, but then suddenly an enemy comes around the corner. You can double tap it to do it quicker, but you've just wasted the uh, the ammunition that you had. Yeah, that's interesting. Also, I do, I I do like things like that. For example, um, if you let's say you fired, uh, you fired, you have 30, 30 bullets in a magazine, you fired 27. So you've got, you only got three left and you're about to enter a new building. You know that, you know, there'll be five enemies. You can't defeat five enemies with only three bullets. So you may as well reload. Well, are you going to reload and save those three bullets? Well, do you, do you think that you're going to survive long enough that you're going to get to that magazine that only has three bullets? And is that magazine with three bullets worth having? Or at that point, when you're you've when you've only got three bullets left, would it be better simply just to get rid of your gun and find a different one lying on the floor? Well, then, usually when I play the game, for example, if I've only got three bullets left and I know that I should reload, I will do the quick reload and I'll just get rid of it because it doesn't make sense to keep those those last three. So yeah, I think yeah. that's a fantastic feature, and I think yeah. every every game should be doing that now because there's I don't think there's an excuse not to to be honest. Every shooting it, game that is. Well, I was saying before, you you weren't confident about being able to say things, and I knew that if I, would, if I said things, then that would probably trigger some sort of yeah. some sort of memory about some sort of other game in some other capacity. Um. So, again, just dot, dot, dotting around this list now. Um, do you know the original Rayman? I never had it. I was really jealous right. of my friends who had it, but I never had it. Okay, so there's a particular feature of Rayman which is very different to a lot of platform games. And whenever you see a review, apart from them always complaining about how hard the game is, but every time someone reviews Rayman, there's always one thing that people mention and people complain about. And that is the fact that in order to... Well, actually, I'll explain this first. So you progress through the levels in an almost completely li linear fashion. And in each level, there's six cages of electoons, and you have to free them from the cages. Mm -hmm. Now, once you've completed the second last level, if you don't, if you haven't freed every electoon in the game, the last level won't open. You have to go back and free all of them, and then you'll get access to the last level. Mm -hmm. Now, 
people complain about this because they say that it should be like an extra thing and all that. Now, in my experience, when I was a kid, the way I, the, I didn't free them all, I got I finished the second last level and I was thinking, well, I'm stuck, I can't do anything. And I thought, do I have to free all the electoons? I wasn't too sure. So then I went and did it and I saw that the last level opened up and then, you know, I could then go and complete the game. But this is something that people complain about because a lot of, you know, a lot of these platform games where you've got these collectibles, these extra things, it's always a case of, well, you don't have to get them, but, well, or, well, maybe you have to get some, but you don't have to get them all. And if you do get them all, then you'll get some sort of bonus ending or whatever. Mm -hmm. But this is a game that just says, no, you, you, you need them all. And to me, that's not an issue because that's just a case. It, it's just a case of, well, if I see that I need them all, then I'm, I'm going to go and get them all anyway. Well, that's just one of two criteria in order to complete the game. Or in order to get to the final level. Well, one, you have to complete all the other levels, and two, you have to do this other thing. Yeah. I think people would feel cheated by having to do that. I don't... I think... Perhaps it's unfair I, to I, the designers that they feel cheated, because that's not what the designers intended. But at the same time, I think that's the issue. I just, I, I, I don't, I don't know. I think it's one of those things where people are just used to something and they take, it, they take that thing for granted. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they they see it, they see it like a fun, jolly platform game, and they say, "Oh no, there's these creatures that've been captured. You have to save them." People's inclination is, "Well, that's optional." Mm -hmm. I think that's what it is. Yeah, it's like video game education. We need to spread the word. Yeah, so I don't think, yeah, I've never, I've never felt like it was an issue. It was just a case of, and plus, I, th I think it's one of those things where you know you need all the to, to free all the electoons, and that means that when you do get to the end, it sort of has a bit more of a prestigious quality to it when you actually do see that final level, because mm -hmm. it's you have had to have done more to get there. Well. I'm definitely not the kind of person who enjoys having to 100% things. I don't think I've 100%ed anything in my life. I, don't, I'm, I, I definitely didn't have any platinum trophies on the PlayStation 3. Um, Counter-Strike is a game I've had for many years, and that's famously easy for to 100% easy to because you can do it all with cheats in-game. <laughs> but that's not something I'm interested in doing ever. And so when I come across uh, something additional, like, um, okay, so in Grand Theft Auto, you have hidden packages. And I remember watching my brothers in Grand, Tr uh, Grand Theft Auto Vice City. I remember them going around collecting all the hidden packages. They They downloaded a map from the internet back in the days when, you know, going on the internet was like a big excursion. Uh, yeah, they downloaded a map where all the hidden packages were. They were looking for them, and you know they had a grand old time. But then, when I played Grand Theft Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, for example, and they had kind of hidden packages or collectibles, I just thought, no, I'm not having any of that, and I've never, never been inclined to do that. But if I had to come across a game like Rayman where it was a requirement, then I think I'd be more inclined to do it because you know, it's it's kind if it's Part of me thinks that if it's optional, it's just been added there to waste my time. I don't know if that's a really, really horrible or harsh way to describe it, but that's, I think that no, is the way I, I see do, it. I, I do think you're onto something there because I think a lot of the time, thing, I think sometimes things are added and because you don't have to do it to you know, complete the story or whatever, the sort of see it as well. We don't need to put as much effort into it, like with the with your example of finding packages, and this is a problem with so many because you do get them these days, the big open worlds with all the collectibles and everything. Lara you get so <laughs> you get all, all you've got to do all these get all these collectibles and whatnot, but it's it's a case of. 
<sighs> the idea of 100%ing it becomes so daunting because the more that you get, the harder they are to find. So say, you have you have 299 out of 300 things in this world. Find the last one. Well, what am I doing? I'm just going to be jumping around and yep. going back and forward in circles for ages. Or surfing the web. Yeah, but even then, that's not so much of a help because that will give you a map of 300. So you've still got to, you know, tick them off one by one. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. I understand. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of a lot of things like that where they don't take that sort of stuff into account. Whereas I think if you are going to make a game where, which most games have it so that 100%ing and completing the main story is two separate things, there are a few games where it is the, the, it's the same thing. But I think they need to sort of put more thought into the extra stuff rather than just thinking, oh, well, that's mm-hmm. for the hardcore. They love our game anyway. We'll just give them whatever. Have you uh, played Final Fantasy XV? Yes, I've platinumed it. Oh, dear. So this, you'd be the perfect person to ask. So my brother is currently playing it. Okay. And uh, I was speaking to him just earlier today, and he said that he's he's reached... I think he's reaching the point that he's, you know, getting frustrated by it simply because he wants to do everything in the game and he's doing something to up to upgrade the weapons to the best to the highest level i mean i played final fantasy 15 just just to be clear i played it for i think four hours or five hours and i was frustrated at the very beginning that i had to watch just loads of cutscenes, and i had to hold rt to push car and that was considered gameplay um Anyway, so my brother is doing this and he's he's just mesmerized at how much uh there is of everything. So how much how many cutscenes there are, how many times he has to just travel from point A to point B to point C. And it all just seems epic in terms of scale, just everything seems big. But the rewards perhaps between between levels or the the rewards not not in terms of gameplay but in terms of you know his own satisfaction from the game they're not as good they're not as great as the scale of uh, the tasks involved how would you describe it how how do you feel it is or do you sympathize yeah i i i do sympathize i don't actually see it's it's been a few years now so i don't remember all the details i actually can't remember any weapon upgrading at all um, I mean, it might have been there. I just can't remember it. Uh-huh. But it's it sounds like it is just that massive list of like quests. That's a thing to rant about. This like the idea of quests, where you know where you talk to like NPCs and they send you to a certain place and all that. Uh-huh. And a lot of it is just faffing around. There was a few in fifteen. I remember. And I remember her discussing uh, this to you before about where the challenge of something is just how hard something is to see on the screen, like with Lara Croft yep. Go. Yep. There are some of the quests in Final Fantasy XV where it's you need to find an item somewhere in this circle. Yeah. It, it's yep. somewhere there, right? <laughs> and it, it's awful. It's... I mean, one of them that wasn't, I mean, the one that was the biggest, that had the biggest circle to cover, that one I just looked online because I was thinking, I can't be bothered with this. But there was one mm-hmm. time, where, and it wasn't even that big of a circle, it was just a circle. And it was, there's a shiny dot somewhere in the circle, find it. I was running around in circles for like half an hour, just staring at the floor. Yep. Just for like half an hour. I don't, What? What? what is the fun in that? Yeah. I agree. And to be honest, I'm glad that I haven't played Final Fantasy XV. <laughs> I don't have the patience for that. I, I don't do have like... the patience for a lot of things. Yeah, it's definitely definitely on the very low end of my Final Fantasy r- ranking. But, you know, speaking of unusual mechanics, now this isn't one I've got written down, but one thing I did really like about Final Fantasy XV is, um, and they could have done it better, there were times where they did mess it up with the uh, forced sleeping in the 
as the story. But the quality of your sleep affects how much ex- it multiplies the experience that you get. Mm-hmm. So if you just sleep at a regular camp, so you, you kill enemies and you accumulate experience, but you don't actually cash that experience in until you sleep. Yeah. So if you sleep at a campfire, it just straight up transfers your experience into your like into your main pool of experience. If you sleep at a hotel, it'll be multiplied by one point two or one point five or whatever. Mm-hmm. But there is later on in the game where there's the giant city there is a really fancy hotel and it costs I think it's like 30,000 gil to sleep there, but it triples your experience Mm -hmm. that you get. So there's a balancing between holding on to experience and not cashing it in and then spending a lot of money to get massive multipliers to that. And I, and that I think is really interesting, but I mean, that is you you won't get me praising that game too much, but mm-hmm. that is one one regard in which I will. Mm-hmm. Reminds me a little bit of Level Up Plan Two. A tiny bit. Uh, yeah, yeah, I suppose. I, I see what you mean. Um Should I should I continue with this some of the smaller ones or should I go into a big one? Let's go into a big one, let's see. Right. Okay. Well, what's your favourite one? So, Have you already spoken about your favourite one? or oh, I've got two. Okay. I've got two here that are big ones that I re- are amongst my favourite games. So one of them is Lightning Returns, which is in my top 10 games. And the other one is Soul Nomad and the World Eaters, which is just outside of my top 10. So I'll talk about, I'll talk about Soul Nomad and the World Eaters because that game is... It's very strange... But I absolutely love it. So, and this is the, this is a case where I'm going to have to try to describe it in terms of just the mechanics as a whole, rather than talking about a particular thing. So, it works sort of what you'd call a tactical RPG. So, you know, you take turns and you move along a grid and you attack other units. But in this game. Every square on the grid doesn't represent a character. It represents a squadron. And in the squadron is a room of up to nine units. Uh, There's a leader and up to eight other units. And when you get a squadron to attack another squadron, depending on their positioning in the squadron, like inside the room, they will automatically do an attack to the other team. So you might have one character which is they do like an AOE attack in the front row, but they heal when they're in the back row. Mm-hmm. Or you might have one that is does a single attack in the front row or does a wider range attack in the middle row or something like that. And so when you fight another squadron, they sort of have a, a head-to-head mini battle one-on-one. And the leader... The way that it works is that if the leader of that squadron dies, the squadron dies. They Uh all they all just die simultaneously. Now, the the way that the leveling system works is that story battles you do you do the story battles in a linear fashion, and you can't go back to previous battles and do them. So there's no, in terms of the story, there's no grinding per se, but you can delve into this other realm of a room, which is basically as, as a room is this like an arrangement of a squadron. You can delve into a room and do inspections, which is a series of randomly generated levels. And the more that you do, and the more that you do in a single row without leaving, you will get RP which you then contribute to your to your characters in the room to boost additional stats, uh, such as leadership will increase the amount of bonus stats that the leader gets. But as you go through these randomly generated levels, 
the levels get harder. So in order to get a good chain or a good, you know, in order to be able to get further and get more RP and get a, a strong chain, you have to reset the room back to its first level and then and then go through again to get this RP to to, to level up the <laughs> The, the the RP is attributed to the room itself, but you distribute it amongst the characters mm-hmm. in the room. I understand. So it's just I, it, I seems, it seems very neat. I like I like how it's yeah. I like how um Okay, so <laughs> if you can imagine it's kind of like a symphony where one instrument has to do something complex but then it also has to do it also has to be part of something else that's even more complex i don't know if i'm explaining this in a, in a good way but it actually yeah. seems quite accessible so for me somebody who doesn't particularly enjoy having to learn new things strange for a teacher but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh okay okay well i'll i'll add that in the scope of video games um it's uh, it's oddly it's accessible. I like it. So it doesn't seem scary. It doesn't seem that you have to worry about too many things at once because it's kind of it's layered nicely. It's a, it can be a bit complicated. I wouldn't have said. I I definitely wouldn't have said this is a game I would recommend to someone just starting games or just starting RPGs. Oh yeah, no no no. To you, get... have to, you have to have a uh, good knowledge. Yeah, there's a lot of. It's one of those things where it does get it. It does get really weird, and I like that. I like I like it when things are weird. <laughs> I've I figured I I noticed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. Uh, mm? Yes. Go. Oh, are you gonna say? No, I was gonna say. So uh, you wanted to also mention Final Fantasy. Uh, 13.2 or Lightning Returns? Lightning Returns. Lightning Returns. It? Yeah. So, so you'll probably... Uh, this this game uh, just absolutely fascinates me and you'll probably um, get, a, get a glimpse of what, what this game has inspired. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but what's, what's strange about Lightning Returns is that... So it's, it's an RPG... Right, as you'd expect. But to put it simply, you don't gain stats by killing enemies. You don't gain any sort of you know levels or experience mm-hmm. or anything like that by killing enemies. The game is set on a time limit and you have to do so many quests and do so much of the main storyline in or within that time limit in order to get to the final boss. Now, the way that you use that time is that there is a resource that you have called EP. It's at a five, and at the end of every day, it fully recovers to whatever the max is. Mm -hmm. Uh, And you can increase that up to nine. Now, enemies don't give you any experience or anything or any stats. Just completing quests just gives you stats so you complete like something simple it's like right strength plus 10 there you go but defeating enemies recovers your ep and your ep is used to activate different abilities now the abilities that they act that it activates it's you've got access to them all the time so for example a simple one kuraga that's that's uh, an EP ability. And basically what that means is that at any point, as long as you've got the EP in a battle infinitely, well, well there's no time restriction to it. You can just spam Kuraga and fully recover your health. Okay. But there's also ones like Chronostasis, which will freeze time for so long. Mm-hmm. And the Teleport, which will, which will allow you to move between different areas in the world. Different, like, hotspots around the world so you're dealing throughout this game you're dealing with the concept of time because certain certain 
like quests are only available at certain times of the day or maybe certain doors are shut at a certain point. And you also have, for example, this train system. So there's a train that goes around the different cities and there's two different train tracks. But when you go on the train, you have to spend time based on the, the scheduling of the train. Mm-hmm. So if, you're, if, say, you're close to when the train's due, it might take an in-game two minutes and an hour. But if you're a long time off, it might take 50 minutes and an hour. So it'll just take that time off of your uh, time resource. Okay. And at certain points throughout the, like the in-game week, or however long it is you have, the game starts to open up these different areas that I call them the paths. So you, that connect the different areas of this world that previously you could only get there by using the train or teleporting, but the game opens up these paths. And so the positive to that is that if you have the ability to do a chronostasis to freeze time, you can get there in less in game time. You can move around the world quicker in game time, but the stronger enemies there and there's all sorts of nasty stuff along the way. Now, this game, and one thing I love about it, and this is something that many people will hate, is this this game doesn't really give you many chances. If you get to the final boss, so you've completed the main, like all the main stories and you've got to the final boss, when you go through the final dungeon and you get to that, that point just before the final boss, you are stuck with what you've got. Mm-hmm. If you one health and you've got no items that's what you've got but just before you get to the final boss there's a little a new feature that's introduced <laughs> there's like a little crystal and it says oh by the way you can start a new game plus so right. you can so you can activate this thing to start the story again you keep all your uh, stats and abilities but you start in the story again so that you can sort of have an have another go at it and the same applies for the secret the secret um like the bonus content as well you actually go through like a, on this extra day if you can make this bonus day there's this final dungeon and with the super boss at the bottom of this dungeon and again if you get to that point and you're just not strong enough to make it you have to start the story from the start mm-hmm. and do all these quests again and it's just everything's just so everything's got the sense of permanence to it. Mm-hmm. it. Nothing is permanent because you can start it again. But a, another like big example of this is the fact that enemies can go extinct. So say if you know you've got like a flan, if you kill so many of the flans, they'll just stop spawning because they're extinct. Mm-hmm. And so in order to bring them back, you have to start the the story again. But making like making the, these enemies go extinct actually helps you in the in this extra dungeon because anything that's still alive roams inside that final dungeon. And I think I think there's like a, like I, I didn't do it, but there's I think there's like a side quest for just wiping out all the wild wildlife in the entire world in a week. In a week, yeah. But the thing, the thing is, though, is that when you actually go through new cycles, you get so much, you get so much more powerful that you can complete everything in less than a day, easily. Okay, well, that mm. makes it more acce- like again. Here's that word accessibility. It makes it more accessible for people who aren't perhaps as confident or people who aren't as good. Yeah, but I mean, I like that more. To me. That's better. The fact that you can restart and do everything is better than you getting to the end and just being like, well, that's tough. You're not strong enough. The mm-hmm. ability to carry over something. But people have this innate feeling of, I don't like time limits. I don't like restrictions. Yes. Yeah, I, I so, understand that. I think when I first heard about Final Fantasy Lightning Returns, because yeah. my one of my brothers bought it for PlayStation 3 because I think he wanted to play it when he came over to visit. He bought it, but he never ended up playing it. So I actually have uh, Final Fantasy XIII two and Final Fantasy Lightning Returns. Yeah, um, but I've never I've never played them, and I do recall that I read the uh, I read the box and saw that it was oh this is weird this isn't normal 
and just I never I never played it. But two the two lightning returns of defense. I also never played Final Fantasy thirteen two. So it's not as though uh, I think well, t- I think I think I was just left with a with a nasty taste in my mouth after Final Fantasy thirteen. Although well, now with hindsight, having played it again years later, I actually appreciate it a lot more. Yeah, well, to be honest, thirteen two isn't particular isn't one of my favorites. I don't. There's a, there's a lot wrong with there's a lot that I don't like with thirteen two. Okay. Yeah. So, do you have any more uh, unusual mechanics? Um, well, those those are the two, two the two one, main two juicy yeah. ones. Yeah, well, the, see, those were those were the ones where it wasn't just like a passing thought. It, those mm-hmm. those were the two ones where it was a case of I thought about it, and it was like I've got to talk about this because I love this game. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, that's that's a bit more to got a bit more to talk about than you know, in like Lightning Returns and Soul Nomad compared to Rayman. You need to get all the cages. Mm-hmm. Um. It's one game. Uh, it's it's an. I suppose we can go through a few more before we end. Do you think? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. So, um, one of them uh, is a game called Before the Echo, and my brother introduced this to me. He was like, he sort of bugged me to play it, and I eventually did. It was originally called Sequence, but there were some copyright issues, so they had to change the name to Before the Echo. And uh, this game is. This game is just unusual in general, um, and the, it's a genre mix. And there's another one on this list, which is a, a, genre, a genre mix. But so basically, it's all menu based, and you fight enemies. It's like an RPG. You know, you've got your magic attacks, your enemies do their attacks, but it's it's a rhythm game. So you've got three different panels that you switch between and each one has a ddr like the arrows coming down okay. and so there's the mana panel and the more arrows that you match up there you gain mp there's the defense panel where if you miss arrows then that's the enemy the enemy hits you and the third one is the spell panel so when you cast a spell it gives you like a little thing that you've got to do to you know, match up the icons to to cast the spell. So you've got until the song ends in order to win the fight. Now, the, that alone is weird. But the thing I wanted to focus on was how you, how the way that you progress is you need to progress through the different flaws of this tower because it's all menu based. Outside of the battle, it's just menus. Mm-hmm. So you progress through the flaws of this tower by making items and the way that you may ha- make items is you well you need like the ingredients and the the enemy when an enemy is defeated they'll like they've got three items that they can drop each with their own percentage chance so the, those are in most cases if not always ingredients and the way that you create items that will allow you to progress to the next floor is you have to engage in this alchemy system where you choose the item you want to create. You choose uh, by default that will require whatever materials are needed. And you choose an amount of experience to spend. And so the way that it works is the amount of ex- the more experience that you spend, the more likely the alchemy is to succeed. If it fails... You don't lose the materials, but you do lose the experience that you spent. So there have been, when I played this game, it was 10 years ago now that I think about it. When I played this game, there was a few times where I put in, I put in enough experience, because it tells you like the percentage based on how much experience you, you know, that you're um, spending. I put in 50% for the amount of experience that would equate to 50%. To try to get an item and it failed like five times in a row and i just got sent back so many levels because once you do that 
that experience is just gone. You have to get it back again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's that's that. How do you motivate? Do you not find it demotivating? Not really. No. I find it. I, I don't. I don't know. I I like it, and I find it very. I, I don't know. I, I, even when it happens, it's sort of. I think it's more so a case of, I like the process, and I know this is. I, I've I've never gambled in my life, right? Uh-huh. So I'm not, you know, I've never cared about loot boxes or anything like that. But I think the fact that you're anticipating the results is part of the experience. That's part of the enjoyment, and then mm-hmm. when it does crop up, when it does appear, and does actually work. And of course, you've got to think about how much experience you want to spend and mm-hmm. and all that. How much experience do you want to have before you expend it? Because experience does affect your level and your strength and all that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you do, like, to, to unlock spells, you have to enter a challenge and you have to spend experience to enter the challenge. Mm-hmm. And if you fail the challenge, you don't get the spell, but you've still spent the experience. And it, adds, it adds tension. I mean, I know it's just... And there's no scave scum, a save scumming involved. You can't. No, no, you can't. You can't. You can't manually save. It's all automatic. Yeah. I suppose okay. that was a bit bigger than I thought it would be. That description. Yeah. <laughs> I'm learning a lot. Yeah. Okay. Do you have any um, more? Yeah. How many? So hold on, I'm just look I'm just looking at this. Um I think two two or three more. Okay. So there's two I definitely there's two I definitely want to talk about. And there's a, there's another there's another one which I suppose can kind of spark a bit of a conversation, but I don't know. Okay. Um Are you familiar with point blank? No. Right. Point point blank. Uh, is a, a light. It, it, I th- I think it's the best one that I've heard. It's a light gun game, okay, right? And it's mostly known for like arcades. You you see it in arcades quite a lot. If you know, it's, it's sort of like Time Crisis sort of mm-hmm. thing. Yeah, it's a series. It's a series of like individual little games, and you've got you know you've got your arcade mode where you've got to like pass so many stages and get to the end and all that. Mm-hmm. But specifically, and I'm I'm thinking this is probably my first introduction to the concept but within point blank there's a quest mode which is basically like an rpg but where the battles are at light gun games so it's not it's not well refined at all it's Mm -hmm. very it's very goofy it's very rough around uh, the edges yeah yeah very rough around the edges and so you'll be walking along this world map and you'll encounter a battle and then you'll be encountered by, it'll be like cut out ninjas, like cardboard ninjas or targets mm-hmm. or random little, uh, I don't know, you know, like those plates that get shot out that you're supposed to like shoot, mm-hmm. those things. Like those will come along and they'll, they'll say like, hey, give us your money and you can say no. And they're like, oh, fine, we'll, we'll fight you. And the fight is just a round of this light gun game. And if you win, you get... <laughs> yeah, and if you win, if you win, it's like, oh, you get experience. And if you lose, then your health goes down by so many points. Mm-hmm. It's really weird. Do you think... Uh... Okay, well, that, that's... A, I was about to ask, <laughs> ask... Well, talk about arcades in general, but I think I should wait for another time. That's a huge topic. Right. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, no, we'll leave that for another time. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, it's. I think I've told you before. This isn't really this isn't really comparable because it's not so much that the um, it's not so much like a marriage between two types of game that hasn't really that lacked polish. But maybe it was yeah. just a game that would lack the polish. But I just recall playing back when I got my first Android phone. I remember downloading some games, and there were games made by a, a developer called Chemco. I've I've spoken about this before, and yeah, they were re- 
they were recognizable to me these games as part of as as like a an rpg genre but they just kind of took they took battles let's say and made them less interesting somehow it's like it was kind of like a combination of pokemon and and final fantasy or just it was kind of like pokemon but just i don't know inherently worse it was slower it was less kind of interesting you had less information about what your character was capable of what your character's stats were and then somehow you sh- you needed to be motivated to wait for your uh wait for the animations to play or something and i don't know it seems it seems uh it seemed to be lacking a lot of finesse is it, is this is this the game you're talking about during your playthrough level of land one like in the possibly, early stages yeah possibly because yeah. i remember you saying that it reminded you of or it might have just been like a browser game or something i can't remember no um so i think the game that level up land reminded me of uh in the, in the in one particular way is like how uh, if you can imagine remember how uh, the old Final Fantasy games were kind of sideways on so your party's on the left the enemies on the right or the other way around rather your party's on the right your enemies are the enemies are on the left um, that's how I kind of envisaged uh, shoot uh, not shooting games role playing games Japanese role playing games um, and then when I played this this one. It was more like Pokemon, where you're you are face to face with your enemy, but you don't see your character. You only see like a really crude, um, pixelated drawing of of the enemy. So just like a it looked like a I think one of the enemies that I came across looked like a Goomba from from Super Mario Brothers. And the, the, of course, the difference between between that is in Level Up Land One, you don't see the enemy; you only see the name of the enemy. But at Level Up Land 1, there is a lot going on with your character, with the enemy, especially with the enemy, there is a lot going on. Whereas I just remember in this, in this, in these games, in these role-playing games that I downloaded, they were just... I don't know, they were kind of... They kind of imitated role-playing games. And that's kind of... Think, that's what I think I'm getting at, is that this game that you're describing... The, the game that you're describing that uses the light guns, it kind of imitates a role-playing game. <laughs> But not particularly yeah. well. Well, those Machine Night games, that was called Machine Night, those Chemco games, they kind of imitate role playing games. Um, right. At least in my experience, my short experience. So, how are you How are you for time? Because I know we've been going on for longer than usual, but there's three that I would like to touch, three more I'd like to touch on here. Oh, uh, we can. You're... Yeah, we should be able to. It shouldn't be a problem. Right, okay. Um, okay, This this one's very <laughs> this this one's this one's probably going to be quick so this is an old an old game treasure island dizzy right i actually listened to a podcast episode once where they actually talked about this game and went into quite a bit of detail about it and it's it's quite interesting but the game itself is very simple so it's a it's like a 2d platform game it's very short but like the gimmick is that you pick up items and you have to transport them around and put them in the right place so like you can, for example there's a weight you go up to a hook you put the weight on the hook it lowers down a platform simple okay. things like that mm-hmm. now what happened in this game uh, because I well I played it on the Amiga but I think originally it was from like the Amstrad or something something you know much older okay. and one of, one of the features of this game, it was one of those things where it's not so much intended as a feature, but it worked out in the end, is that you can hold three items at a time, <laughs> but you can only use the items in the order that you pick them up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, now, the way that that works is that you have this, like a menu of three different inventory slots. And whenever uh-huh. you press whenever you press the button, it sort of nudges everything up. Okay. So if you're on top of something and you press the button, it nudges it into the bottom slot. Okay. And whatever's in the top slot is either dropped or used somehow. Now this and is if you press, te- and if you, you press you activate the function to use the uh, the inventory, it will use the top one or the bottom one. 
Yeah, it will use the top one because okay. there's only one. There's only one button. Mm-hmm. There's only one button for the whole thing. So it's one button to like um Act- to, pick, the... to pick up and to activate, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So you've got these three inventory spaces. So what ended up happening, which actually actually makes the game better in a way, mm-hmm. is that you actually have to think about the order of the items that you have. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about that is that sometimes you need to hold on to items. So, for example, the snorkel, the way the snorkel works is that if it's in your inventory, you can can go underwater. Uh If if it's not in your inventory and you go, it's just water, you die. So, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) So if you're in water and then you nudge the snorkel outside of your inventory, then you, you just die. Mm-hmm. So you end up with these situations where you're in, you're in this body of water, you've picked up a snorkel outside and you go inside and you find an item inside the water. We need to use the item. But then it's like you're stuck inside the water. It's like, I need to get out of the water so that I can drop the snorkel and pick up the other item and then pick up the other item again and then pick up the snorkel after that. Uh-huh. And so it's this sort of. But okay, so you can actually drop items. That's that's where you lost me. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, if you yeah. if you if you lose the items forever. Yeah, you can drop the item, and then it's there for you to pick up again. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you do get these situations where you have to juggle. find like a, a pocket of air and juggle the items around. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just it's like it's technical limitation. But they they somehow just made it work. Yeah, well, it's a technical <laughs> limitation that perhaps um, perhaps was intentional, perhaps wasn't intentional, but it became a gameplay feature. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I like it. Yeah, um, so yeah, I'll get through two more. Um, the f- the first one. Now, this is this is quite a weird game all around in general, but. I, th- I suppose my main point here is to do with the the approach to balancing something. So Poi Poi Two. Now Poi Poi. I think Poi 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 One and Poi Poi Two. These are games that I think are great in their own way, but nobody else has ever heard of them. Uh-huh. So, um, the general idea of of these games is that it's a multiplayer game. So you've got four characters in this arena and you have to run around picking up like rocks and little like missiles and stuff and just chuck them at each other. And you get all these different power ups and points and stuff. And okay. you have to win the round by getting so many, by getting the most points at the end of end of three rounds. Now throughout this game, you get these, these items called uh, these gloves and the way that it works is you choose a gl- before you start like a round, you choose a glove and your character can use the power that's in that glove. Sort of like a magic spell. But you need to you need to like use it on an item, like on a rock. You need to use it and it'll consume cycle power, which is basically like MP. Mm-hmm. Now in Poi Poi One the way that it works is that every character has a glove, like a line of gloves that's associated with that character. You, as as just a human player, can pick whatever glove you want. As long as you've unlocked it in the main, like the campaign, as long as you've unlocked it, you can pick whatever glove you want. Mm -hmm. But the opponent will all, like computer characters will always pick a glove that's associated with that character that's within that, that upgrade line. Okay. Um. Now, so how can you abuse it? Well, Poi Poi One. In Poi Poi One, every glove has five tiers, so there's more variety. Uh, slightly more variety. Uh, three of those tiers are basically the same, but better. But there's more variety uh, within like a single line of glove. But in Poi Poi Two, what they did was they made it so that the the gloves don't only have two tiers, so they don't have that many stages, but every character has like a compatibility rate with each of the gloves in the game. Mm -hmm. So every character has a 100% rate with whatever is their main glove. And for everything else, 
it varies. So, so say for example, you've got a character that can shoot out this blaze of fire. Um, if a character has a low synchronization with, with that glove, if they use that fire glove, the fire will only travel like not very far or whatever. So that's how they balance it. Now, the <laughs> one glove in particular is a teleporter, and the character Dee Dee is the what he is the one that specializes in this teleporter glove. Okay. And the way that teleporter works is you pick up the item, you use you use the the power, and it basically it warps you to another point in the level. Mm-hmm. Now, it's pretty bad. It's not a very good glove. Mm-hmm. So. The way that they, so, so that's like, in terms of characters, that makes Dee Dee worse because his special his special glove is one that isn't very good in general. Mm-hmm. Now, the way that they try to balance this, they could make it so that Dee Dee's got like really high stats, but then it's sort of like, well, then you could just find another glove that he's really good with. Mm-hmm. The way that they try to balance this was that they took that teleporter glove that's already bad and made it so horrifically awful for everybody else. So if anybody else uses this glove, they will literally teleport like a step away, if that. So that's that's the one approach to balancing that's like... I, I don't know. What, Is that what, enough, what, though? Is that enough to balance that glove? Because surely well, that would just no. surely that doesn't solve the problem of people not wanting to play as that character. No, it <laughs> it doesn't. It's just it's just a case of you've got to do I, something. <laughs> yeah, it, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll just well, you know, you know, it's kind it's kind of like well, this this other character has the option to do this terrible thing. That makes them well. No, I just wonder if that terrible thing then. <laughs> yeah. So can you can you think of any? Because the thing is, I struggle to think of any sort of other thing in a game that has that approach to balancing. Can you think of anything? Uh... I don't think there is, really. No, I can't either. And the thing is, as well, is that this is a game I really like. I really, I really like this game. It's just, I just find it funny that I just thought, oh well, this this character special ability is terrible. We'll just make it so much worse for everybody else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't, I can't, I can't think of any other game that that does that. Um. So, the last one I was going to talk about, and this is some, I imagine you'll probably have something to say about this because it's yeah. something that it's something that doesn't doesn't take very long to describe, and it's something that I I know you've played at least one game that has this this sort of feature, right? Okay. Uh, but have you played Final Fantasy Two? No. Right. Okay. Do you know anything about Final Fantasy Two? Not particularly. Right. Okay. So <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that that's all right because I haven't. There's, <laughs> that means I can I can just like describe mm-hmm. quickly how how it works. Now, Final Fantasy Two. Uh, for for the time because this this was made, this was released in the same year that I was born in 1988. So there wasn't much to go on at the time. And the way that this works is with the leveling system is that you level up whatever you use so if a character uses swords their sword level their sword mm-hmm. skill levels up okay. if they cast fire their fire levels up mm-hmm. um and the same applies to stats in general so for example to make your character's attack rise you attack enemies and the way that their hp rises is that they get hit, like when they get hit that mm-hmm. contributes to leveling up their their HP. Now this is this is a game that so many people they say is awful. Um, I think it's pretty good. I don't think it's one of the best. I, th- I think it's good, but again, it's just 
I mean, the closest other example I can think of that you that I know you would be familiar with is Oblivion. Yeah, that's the first thing that came to mind, to be honest. Yeah, where you use something and it levels up. But for, the thing is, like for that game, I just remember, for example, like putting an elastic band around the analog stick so that my athletics goes up, or just like standing on the spot and jumping and doing other things. But, but here's an important question: In Final Fantasy II, uh, do they have level scaling? No. Or- no, see that's 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 why I think it'd be fantastic. That's actually a really cool thing. So uh, it wouldn't really work with Oblivion simply because the designers wanted it to be that you can do anything at any time and you can have fun and it can be immersive. Whereas yeah. with Final Fantasy Two, I mean, I don't think they. I think it would have been quite difficult, or it would have taken too much memory to uh, um, to implement a level level scaling system. I think it's a lot cheaper as far as resources are concerned, simply to have set levels. Uh, well, but the, uh, the, the point I'm making, trying to get to is that I think that's fine. If you're leveling up something that you're using, um, the incentive... Okay, so no, okay, no. Here's, here's what I'm actually getting to. Uh, you just have to be more careful in designing the enemies and designing you know, at what stage you meet what enemy um, in order for the player not to be overwhelmed or not to just feel that it's too easy or too difficult. But I think that's, that's, that's the same is true with everything. You just have to look at it a different way. Whereas the reason people have a foul taste in their mouth after oblivion, for example, is because you get the impression that you just have to stand and hit a crab all day with your dagger in order to level up your, your blade. Well, what what all as opposed this isn't something that came to mind, but I think one thing else that's interesting with Final Fantasy Two is that the entire game is pretty much just one large continent that you can, in theory, get to any point. Like from the start of the game, you can reach pretty much any other place in the game. Mm-hmm. It's just that at certain like there are like these artificial barriers where enemies just suddenly become really strong. Mm-hmm. But you can if you if you grind forever, like just from the start of the game, walk to one of the final villages and buy like really powerful magic. But the the thing is with the the level up as you use thing mm-hmm. is that, and I don't know if I don't know I don't want to say that this is a problem or this is an issue, but um. What it, what it essentially means is that certain spells just won't level up, like a sooner and stuff like that, because you're not really going to be using it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you know they I mean? use it rarely. Well, then surely the 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 calculations for how quickly it levels up should be altered as well. So the frequency, yeah, well, the frequency with which you use. Okay, so let's say you have direct and indirect magic. Well, then indirect magic should be. Um, you should be able to level up indirect magic a lot faster than direct magic, let's say, because if you use it less often. Well, I tend to pref- I tend to prefer uh, when when games have a sort of um, not so much leveling what you use, but leveling what you allow you, yourself to have access to. Mm-hmm. So, um, oh, yeah. Material- That's what- yeah. I think that's cleaner. That's a that's a cleaner way yeah. of doing things. So like like material or whatever, you can equip material. You don't have to use it, but because you've got it equipped, it will level up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. So, yeah. So I think I know I know for the second half well, the second half of this I've done most of the talking, but <laughs> it's all right. Yeah, well that's just it. I have I've I'm I'm happy to listen. I'm yeah. Learning. Like I said, but well, I think uh, I think I prefer. Uh, maybe this isn't really on topic, but I'll finish with uh, with a thought. Maybe there'll there'll be another conversation out of this. Actually, I don't have an issue with spoilers in general. So when it comes okay. to films, when it comes to games, anything really, even books, I don't mind spoilers. I don't mind reading about something, and in fact, I enjoy uh reading about something okay i'm trying to think of the last example take final fantasy 13 before i played it for a second time 
Uh, and I actually, I don't know if I completed it, but I got f- much further than I did the first time. Um, when I was when I was younger and I played it when I was still in school, but before I played it for the second time, I actually watched a lot of it. I actually read about lot, uh, read of read a lot of it. So I watched some cutscenes simply because I thought they, uh, I thought they, they looked interesting visually. And then I read a lot about it. So I read about the story. I read about the gameplay mechanics. I pretty much learnt everything there is to learn about it. And still I played it and still I enjoyed it. I don't think, I don't think for me, it takes away from, from the enjoyment of, of games for the enjoyment of anything really to know stuff about it before I play it. But I can understand why somebody might not like that. And I can understand why people don't like spoilers. So why, how, how, What's brought this to mind? The just our entire conversation, just like you uh, explaining things to me about games. I mean, the likelihood is that I won't play them. But to be honest, now I'm more interested in playing Final Fantasy Two since you've since you told me. Is is it the sim? Is it similar to Final Fantasy Nine? Because I think in Nine you level up your your gear as well. But no, uh, it's, n- not, it's not going to be. It's not going to be quite the same. No, well, in nine you equip stuff with stuff with like abilities on it, yeah. and as you as you gain AP, mm-hmm. you the character that like like gets that ability innately, so that they don't need to have the equipment with it on anymore. Ah, uh-huh. okay, so that's yeah. that's not the same. But the yeah. point is that I don't mind learning about I don't mind learning about these things at all. Um, and in fact, I think in some ways. It's gonna, it's gonna at least bring things to my attention that I otherwise wouldn't have known, and actually yeah. encourage me to play to play some of these games. Yeah. Well, I never thought, I never thought to myself, oh well, I'll say this, and then friend, I want to play this. I thought, no, no, it's just here are some Here's funky examples. Yeah. Yeah, just funky examples of things. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It's been yeah. as as always. It's uh, it's interesting. It's uh, and the the audio has been. Yes. Recorded properly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, yeah. My, I'm sorry. The first nine minutes. I don't know what your plan is. Are you going to just upload all of it, or will you just cut it? Uh, uh what I'll do is I'll start it off. Well, what my plan is, I'll start it off, um, and I'll just just take like random s- s- splices, random samples of just stuff I said, and then we'll do the whole like, oh wait, your audio wasn't recording thing. Okay, that, that's the so, plan at least. Uh, it's going to be a little faff on your end. Either way. It's all right. Yeah. So what I did was I, when I was examining my sources, my microphone, uh, my microphone capture, I have a, uh, an artificial intelligence voice filter. No, it's just no, I don't even know if it's AI, but it's just a, uh, uh, sorry, not even, it's not AI. It's just a noise filter. Uh, and it's absolutely fantastic. It makes my microphone a lot better than it is. Uh, yeah. It makes my microphone sound a lot better than it is. And I tried to get to the filters to double check that it's active and I double clicked it thinking that's what I had to do. So nope, that didn't, that didn't open up the window. So I closed that and I clicked on right clicked and selected filters, but it turns out that double clicking it changes the input. Are we going to, uh, decide on a topic for next time? Oh, a topic for topic for next time. I don't know. Uh, As well, recently, I was thinking, yeah, okay, go, go. Right. I was sick because I know you said you wanted to do an episode on nostalgia and they said that would just be talking about Far Fantasy Eight a lot. Probably. But I think that I think that would be good because you know, just talk about different talk about like what nostalgia means, how it affects mm-hmm. you know, different like games and all that and just different like random examples of things that have happened. So I'd be happy to do an episode on nostalgia. But what was it you were gonna say? Uh well Nostalgia is going to be a very, very big topic. I think I have plenty, plenty of examples and stories from my, from my childhood, but, um, right. we could also talk about, uh, just games that we've played. So recently I've been playing cyberpunk. So I, right. got it, I installed it, especially, in, uh, well, I'm playing it on computer and perhaps I was, perhaps I would, uh, if if it would at, at all match uh, what kind of things you're playing, you could talk about just a game and what things that you found interesting or things that you found that are good, things that you found that are bad. 
Yeah. Uh, well, actually, I don't. Yeah. To be honest, you're talking about things I've played recently. I don't think there's going to be much to say there, other than like a bunch of idle games, and I don't know how mm-hmm. much content <laughs> I could get out of that. Uh huh. Okay. Well, I'll I'll keep that uh, I'll keep that idea. So let's say uh, the next the next time we talk, we can talk about um, nostalgia. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. And I sh- I shall. I shall make some notes, but I'll, I'll, I don't want to, I mean, I know you say you like listening, but I don't want to dominate the conversation. Oh, I don't think time. you will next time. Yeah. Oh, well. And I didn't really talk much about Level Land this time. So, S- yeah. Success. I mentioned although, it twice and you laughed twice. Yeah. yeah. Although, although I will break that streak and mention that uh, Lightning Returns with the whole final boss thing, that uh, was a big influence Level Land too. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, let's go back and uh go back and get more powerful. Beef yeah. up. Yeah. Right. Uh, speaking of which, um with regards to playing Final Fa- uh, Final Fantasy Level Up Land 2. Uh, yeah. Just normally. Well, I'm sure you know it's a crazy time right now. Um, yes. My wife and I are doing some volunteer work. So I have less time than I would normally. So there yeah. is there is no schedule. I don't know when the, our next call can be, and I don't know, um, I don't know when I'll next be, I'll next have time, and I'll be in the right mindset to play uh, Level Up Land Two. So it's just, yeah, just when I goes. can, yeah, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm usually free on Saturday evenings. Next week, mm-hmm. maybe I'm working late next week, so I, I don't know. But you know, Saturday evenings are the most common available time for me, mm-hmm. okay. even if every few weeks or so mm-hmm. okay well all i'll do to finish this is say that war is stupid and that's it <laughs> what's stupid war oh yes absolutely pointless absolutely right well have a good evening enjoy yourself yes and uh yes. prepare some notes on nostalgia I'm, I'm sure i'll i'll be talking a lot as well oh yeah bye-bye see ya